this uh, directly, but he, uh, that's kind of why she furthered herself from the grandmother, right? Towards the beginning is because they had this this thing going on and then she kind of forgot about it mm -hmm. or whatever, right? I think so. Something like that. That the you know because I feel like they kind of foreshadow that in the beginning. Of, yeah. That's why that this family is estranged from I, from the grandmother. I think that's where uh, Annie's brother's suicide stemmed from. Is the grandmother was trying to make him uh, payment. Okay. Yeah. And you know because he he thought that that was wrong and you know was really uh, freaked out by that. That's why he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And then it cuts to black, right? Yeah. Well, just, well they we they're they, all like hail. There's a the kind of homage to Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, it's it's. I I think I texted you this after after we watched the movie, the uh, back in June when it, when it opened. That I got like real like Rosemary's Baby's vibe mm -hmm. from Rosemary's Baby vibe from a uh, from this whole movie with uh you know like the in Rosemary's Baby it was devil worship. But in, in this one, you know, they're worshiping uh, payment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it was like a very creepy drama, and then you realize that all oh, these people that you thought were your neighbors or were this were actually yeah. devil worshippers. And in this, it was uh, you know the the grandmother was some kind of uh, cult leader, and they all worship this this payment. And yeah. at the end, yeah, they're like hail payment, which at the end of Rosemary's Baby, they're like you know hail Satan. But they're like these older people. So yeah. yeah. Very weird imagery. Yeah. And if you if you freeze frame all those people that are in at the end of the film, you can see they're all in. in if you watch the movie, they're a lot. A lot they're all in the background through mm -hmm. various scenes, like at the funeral and all this stuff. Like there, you can catch them all uh, mm -hmm. throughout the film. Like oh, they so were there the entire there, time. Yeah. yeah. Kind of watching over. Yeah. Over that family. Everything. Overseeing, make sure that stuff happened. Yeah. And it's cut to black. Fucking crazy. <laughs> and then it's got like a, re a really weird like uh, 60s folk song mm -hmm. by Judy Collins that plays over the credits. <laughs> um, I actually have, so I have some swan facts and then I have a uh, interview okay. with uh, Ari Aster, Aster. Where he talks about pretty much uh, like the his direct influences for the mm -hmm. film. Do you want to jump into yeah, that? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Influences for like different things. I'm paying homage to a lot of like subgenres in the film. Like for instance, like there are a lot of allusions to you know the ghost movie, right? And so f films that I love in in that in that realm would be you know well the Japanese do it so well with like Ugetsu and Kwaidan and uh, and Onibaba. <laughs> I wanted to make a film that sort of, you know, that that could belong to these like subgenres, like as a, as a as a ghost story, something that you know that that could exist alongside a film like you know Jack Clayton's The Innocents or The Haunting or something like that, um, while also like uh, playfully transgressing like those rules. Uh, when I was screening um, films for the crew before we made made the film, I I tried to not screen too many horror films. It was important to me that, that the film s sort of serve as a great horror film, but also like a f first to just serve as, as a really rich uh, f family drama in the same vein as something like Don't Look Now. Because this is a film that's also very much about grief and, and at least hopes to, you know, seriously wrestle with that. Christine is dead. She is dead. Dead. I want the film to serve, like, first as a very serious drama about trauma and grief and the corrosive effect that grief and trauma can have on, on a family dynamic. As far as atmosphere is concerned, like, The Shining was, you know, was a big one. Although I kind of, I, I think The Shining is almost more of a, it, it works almost, for me, more as a comedy than it does a horror film. Yeah. 
What's up, Doc? Because you've got Jack Nicholson, and he's, like, crazy from the beginning before they even get up to the hotel, like he's ready to kill his family well before he even gets the job. You've always been the caretaker. And then you have, like, the, the title slamming in, for, like, Monday, and it's, like, Wednesday. He's, he's gone totally insane, like, three days in. It was important to me to sort of sustain this doom-laden tone where you know something awful is coming. I do love the horror genre. I've been disappointed in so many of, of the films that have been coming out in the last couple decades. The films that like really affected me as a kid were the ones that did not allow me to, to move on. Carrie was a film who, who, whose images like really haunted me as a kid. Specifically, you know, the stuff with Piper Laurie chasing Sissy Spacek around the house, which, you know, which is like candlelit, this like candlelit house, that, that like blissful smile on her face as she's trying to kill her daughter. Sissy Spacek's transformation in that film from this like vulnerable girl to like this like agent of just destruction and just hey, those like wide eyes. There are a lot of images in Hereditary where I, I'm, I'm, because that film had such a deep effect on me, like, I don't think I could make a horror film where, I, where I'm, I'm not in some way, like, recalling that. And, and in some films that aren't even really uh, acknowledged as horror films, but for me, they certainly are. Like, I mean, anything by Peter Greenaway, who, who I think is, I mean, I think he's probably just like an evil person. It's something about the, the artifice of his work. Like, there's this, like, thoroughly artificial quality to his films. Um, and this, like, very clinical, cold, uh, just, like, inhuman... Uh, I remember reading that the MPAA rated it NC-17 for tone, and they told Peter Greenaway that there was nothing he could cut because of, because it was just the overall tone. And if you've seen the film, it makes total sense. For me, the image would be the lover being rolled out for the thief, who's played by Michael Gambon. Helen Mirren has had the cook bake his body, and he's rolled out for Michael Gambon to eat, and he looks like a roasted turkey, and it's deeply upsetting. It, it ruined my life. I don't know if you ever did this in, like, video stores, where you would, like, pull, pull the videotape out of a box and, like, put it into another one. So I, I put that into, like, Weekend at Bernie's 2, and, <laughs> and just, I, 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 I regretted it for years. Swan facts, anyone? Oh, yeah. Swan facts. Shout out to Vic. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of the uh, traditional jump scares, the film goes for the juggler with more emotional and tonal dread, yeah. as we talked about throughout this uh, show. The original cut of this film is over three hours long. Oh, damn. Because it's, it's what? It runs over two right yeah, now. It's about 216, I think, or something yeah. like that. Uh, the entire Graham house was actually built on a soundstage. Huh. Um, Tony originally said that she didn't want to do any more dark roles or horror films and uh, actually opted for comedies only, but when she read this script, it was so good to her that she couldn't pass it up. <laughs> good, uh, good choice, yeah. I think. Uh, in Peter's first school scene, there's a homage to the original Halloween film. The words escaping fate are being discussed on the chalkboard, which is something that actually happens to the main character in the original Halloween as well. Mm, okay. uh, this is Ari Aster's debut film, which is fucking insane. Yeah. Because it's so good. Well, that was, that's crazy because there's a lot of... Between The Witch and... Um, it follows. I think those were all debut debut films too. Mm. People doing their homework, man. Yeah, crazy. I think uh, 
Tony Collette said that Ari is one of was one of the most overly prepared directors that she's ever worked with. Well, so he must, be, he must be a Kubrickian yeah. type uh, fellow. Um, Astor wrote detailed backgrounds for all the main characters even before he had started writing the screenplay at all. So he had known what these people were doing hmm. in his mind for forever, I'm sure. Uh, the film was actually shot in just 32 days. That's pretty short. The house was constructed on the soundstage in Utah in order to line up the shots with the miniatures. Uh, I was wondering where that took place because... There's the the stretch between the house and where they go to the party is is pretty desolate, mm-hmm. and then even uh, at the the cemetery when they bury when they bury Charlie, there's yeah. some, like really beautiful mountains in the in the background. I was wondering where that movie took place. Utah, so. Utah. Yeah, because when uh, when he takes off from the party house, I was like, I was Alyssa, I was like, where the fuck are they at? Like, he said they were going to the hospital. It's like a thirty mile uh, drive. Where the hell is this house at? Yeah. Like, yeah. who goes? I mean, I guess there's parties, you know, where you drive out of your way to go to some weird ass house. But I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, whose parents are like leaving their kid alone with like no neighbors around? Like, what the hell's going on? But yeah, that makes sense. Pretty empty ass. Looking place. place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, the great stage for the film, right? Yeah. You could see why they picked it. Uh, the film often is referred to as a family drama rather than a uh, horror film. Hmm. Uh, Ari actually has 10 screenplays already uh, completed that he hopes to uh, direct before the end of his career, yeah. which is uh, insane. insane. Yeah. Uh, Ari thought Utah would be a great place to shoot because of the wide open spaces and mountains yeah. that create this kind of ambiance that uh, actually works uh, pretty well for mm-hmm. the film. Utah is a beautiful state. Uh, the production designer and miniaturist worked closely to ensure that all the sets were exactly the same. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Detail. I wonder how much that cost to. Uh, yeah. That must have been where uh, the you know large portion of the money went to creating that painstakingly. It just, uh, like, looks completely the like exact. Yeah, because you got to yeah. pay that person to sit there for hours completing this. Thing. Yeah. Insane. The uh, the kids Alex and Millie actually knew each other from attending the same private school prior to this film. Hmm. So they had that kind of uh, connection. Hmm. I know the director made them go out and uh, kind of hang out with each other in character okay. for hours to kind of get that on-screen kind of, uh, I guess, sister, you know, brother-sister relationship, yeah. which I think... That's cool. Yeah. That's smart. Tony, uh, Tony said that her most memorable moment from the film was when she was uh, doused in water where, uh, that's made to look like uh, the paint thinner, mm-hmm. which is a pretty uh, yeah. rad scene. Um, Alex Wolf is actually a known horror buff. Uh, okay. uh, this was Millie Sh- uh, Shapiro's first on-screen role. Dang. How old is she... Uh, I don't know. Um, Actual age. Yeah. yeah. Pretty young, though. That's crazy, though, for this to be her first movie. I think she was uh, an actor, a stage actor. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, before this, I think I'd read that when the movie had first come out. Uh, it doesn't have her age. <laughs> I was trying to look that up to kind of see how old she was. You fail us, technology. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that pretty much wraps up episode 83. Yeah. Hail Payment. Yeah, that was a good one, man. That was yeah. a that was a really good pick. That was an awesome. Uh, I'm glad you suggested it, though. This was fun, even though you don't remember suggesting. Well, it. I think we we had talked because I had told Wes, you know, I, you know, let's let's put together a schedule because I wanted to do the show, a, you know, a handful of times before yeah. the end of the year. And uh, I said, you know, what should we do in October? Because October is generally, you know, horror movies. Yes. We are basically tossing back and forth what would be a very good episode to kind of be like the pinnacle of hollow, like our Halloween yeah. uh, month. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what about Hereditary? Yeah. And he was like, dude, I'd totally be down to yeah. do Hereditary, you know? So it was kind of a mutual, I guess, pick. But, yeah, I couldn't think of anything better to talk about since it was... You know, this. there's no middle ground for this film. You either love it or completely despise it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how people think this movie's boring, 
It, it might be a lot of things. Well, I know some people who think it's boring. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Well, I, I, I told you, I think it's one of the best horror films to come out in a very long time. Oh, yeah, that's really good. 